know who's the shove it man. Shove it squad, just to be clear before we delve too deeply into this list, I do understand that Dixie and TNA were not flat out responsible for paying for everything that TNA wasted their money on. I know that the network footage bills for certain things. But let's just ignore that, because ultimately it's TNA that was wasting the network's money on certain things. So even if they didn't pay for it, it's still a waste of money that happened involving TNA. So we haven't done a list for a while, but thank you to Dominic over on Patreon, who suggested that today we do the top 10 biggest wastes of money in TNA history. And if you want to make the Hawk talk, sign up on Patreon today. Going live and on the road in 2012-2013. So after they lost the <coughs> Monday Night Wars to WWE in 2010, they were looking to compete in other ways. Eric Bischoff pushed Dixie to take TNA on the road in 2012, and they even let the lease expire on the impact zone, so they were dead serious about this. The idea was that taking the show on the road would help make the show feel more big time. TNA was normally stuck in the impact zone, or as it had become known, the cast member zone. A few hundred people turned up week in, week out, many of who did not even pay. It was hard to get a reaction from these cast members who'd seen it all before. The show was also pre-taped, so results were often leaked online before the shows, and Bischoff wanted the shows to become unpredictable like WCW used to be. So they went on the road with the dreams of large crowds and expanding the TNA fan base across America. They did get some big crowds, but they also got some bad ones, and when it was bad it cost them dearly. TNA chose to run with the Aces and Eights storyline throughout most of the live show tour to help tie in with the unpredictability factor. The shows did feel more important, but it also cost TNA a lot of money, and they couldn't support it for an entire year. I don't talk about this time period in TNA enough. It was an interesting one. You can also add to this that they wasted money on huge arenas to only have 800 people show up. Yeah, that can't have been cheap. In Ohio Valley Wrestling. This was the former WWE developmental territory up to 2010, which saw some success with the likes of Randy Orton, John Cena and Brock Lesnar all benefiting from their time. So when that deal with the WWE ended, it seemed like a no-brainer for TNA to swoop in. Unfortunately, TNA soon proved that they could screw up a no-brainer, as ultimately they gained no benefit from the partnership with OVW. They mostly signed wrestlers and dumped them in OVW because they had nothing better for them to do. They weren't really using it as an academy. Lots of guys on OVW's roster was just local guys who were not actually signed to TNA. It's not as if they were signing lots of potential stars and setting them up at OVW. It was just literally a dumping ground for people they didn't want. They seemed to start understanding when they ran the TNA gut check segments, but none of the guys hired through this stupid reality TV show segment had superstar potential. Most of them were just skinny young boys who were signed and then we barely ever saw them again. They were all just dumped in OVW. Sam Shaw probably saw the most development in OVW, but it can't have helped that much because even as Dexter Loomis now in WWE is still in NXT developing and people pretty much hate him. It was a partnership that they gained literally nothing from. So even if TNA weren't having to pay bucks for this partnership, it has to go down as a massive waste of money, because they got nothing out of it. Christy Hemi There's lots of Hemi fans in my videos, but stop gritting your teeth, stop shaking with anger, take a few deep breaths and listen to me before I smack you one. Although Hemi has made this list, it isn't a case of the Hawk blaming her talents. I blame TNA for not capitalising on her correctly. TNA signed a lot of recognisable male wrestlers from the WWE to give their male roster a star power boost, but they were still lacking in the female department. Probably because the knockouts division didn't exist in 2005. So when they brought Christy Hemi in, her first major storyline in TNA was about sexism and wrestling, and she feuded with Billy Gunn and the Road Dog. This took away a lot of her popularity as she came across as whiny and a massive hypocrite given how she had been portrayed prior to this. She was in Playboy for God's sake. After that, she started managing the Rock and Rave infection, which was also horrible. The team of Lance Hoyt and Jimmy Don't Let Him Near a Mike Rave cut awful ear-splitting promos every week, and they had the highest loss record TNA had ever seen at the time for two years straight. Lance Hoyt was her boyfriend, and they would make out on the way to the ring. By doing this, they took her off her pedestal and booted her so hard into the ground. She went from portraying a 10 out of 10 to being a grimy-looking groupie. This diminished her star power even more. Then the TNA Knockouts division started, and they were trying to focus more on serious wrestling as opposed to the stuff WWE was doing at the time. Awesome Kong and Gail Kim pretty much ruled the division. Then when Kim left for the WWE, Taylor Wilde stepped into her shoes to help carry the division. Just to be clear, Hemi was never hired for her wrestling ability, but TNA did try and improve this. So we've got a lady who was a star in the WWE, but the things that got her over in the first place have now gone. So she's essentially a green wrestler, She's barely had any matches, so what do you pay someone like that? 
She was reportedly on over 100k a year. Jesus. This was almost the most any woman earned in TNA, although Mickey James may have topped that in the end. Some of the TNA knockouts were so poor at the time that they were earning $500 an appearance and working second jobs like working in a sunglasses hut. TNA eventually moved her to be a ring announcer to try and get their money's worth. At the start, it was hard to listen to, but she did improve in this role. But let's be honest, you can't pay a ring announcer 100 grand a year. She wasn't really involved with any storylines until 2014 when Samuel Shaw started stalking her. She didn't bring anything to the show and cost a lot more than the other women, so that's why she's made this list. So if you don't agree with that, I'll hit you with a brick. Bubba the Love Sponge, moving on to one that I think you'll all agree with. I'm sure we could stack in most of the TNA signings who came in in 2010 with Hawk Hogan, but for fear of angering the Hawk, I'd rather just focus on the one individual for now. And I think this guy was the most pointless and biggest waste of money out of them all. For me, the award has to go to Bubba the Love Sponge. The overweight radio host who was best friends with the Hawk came in as a backstage announcer role, but didn't have anything interesting to say. The poorly lit backstage segments were made worse by the size of his body, like a solar eclipse as a fat fold blocks out the light bulbs in the building. He squatted over TNA talents who'd been beaten up backstage like he was taking a dump on them. He wasn't even interested in getting the medical attention, or who they even were. And what an appropriate image that is, because Hawk Hogan and Dixie brought him in to hype up their shows, but ultimately, he dumped all over everything they represented. He also got beaten up by Awesome Kong and Mick Foley for real, so he wasn't exactly liked backstage, so what was the point? He couldn't wrestle, and he didn't have anything we wanted to hear. He was just a fat greaseball sucking up all the money and bringing absolutely nothing to the show. Pac-Man Jones If I wanted to make a list of all the money that TNA had wasted on celebrities, I'd have plenty of options. So a bit like me not wanting to just name a bunch of wrestlers who came in in 2010, I'm going to narrow it down and just keep it to a few celebrities. It's also worth pointing out that a lot of the celebrities that TNA brought in were C-listers who nobody had heard of. Pac-Man doesn't really fall into that category because they did admittedly have some name value. For all the wrong reasons. I've already made an entire video on his TNA run, check the link on the screen. I'll sum it up here though. He was a football player who was famous from all his arrests he kept having. The Football League got tired of him and suspended him for a year, so TNA hired him to get some press. Due to him being under a football contract, he was not allowed to do anything physical in the ring. So congratulations TNA, you just hired someone with the personality of a gone-off spud who can't wrestle either. They put him in a tag team with Ron Killings called Team Pac-Man, and they somehow won the tag belts, despite Pac-Man not being able to do a single physical move. The matches all contain convoluted spots where the opposing wrestler hurt themselves, like crashing into the corner or getting a football thrown at their nutsack. Reportedly, he was paid a whopping $25,000 per appearance, and he made at least eight. It was the easiest money he ever got. Nothing was gained from his time in TNA, and if anything, it made TNA fans tune out. I will end it by saying that the matches weren't as bad as people like to say. It was more of a case of people's hatred for the guy clouding the matches that were involved. Still, at that amount of money, he had to make this list. The UK Tour Hang on, hear me out with this one. Anyone from round here will tell you that the TNA UK shows were great. The wrestling was great, the attendances were large, and lots of money changed hands. TNA had a hardcore following in the UK, which for a brief time may have been more popular than the WWE. TNA was shown on Spike TV in the UK, which was a free channel, and most people had access to it. WWE, on the other hand, was on Sky Sports that people had to pay an expensive subscription to, so there was more eyes on the TNA product in the UK. Once a year, TNA would tour the UK, and they would do it to call it as a thanks for all the support of the UK fans. They would run a few TV tapings with some house shows thrown in the middle. All of these shows had large attendances in the thousands, whilst TNA was struggling to draw a few hundred in parts of the US. The merchandise stands were as busy as a back alley bar on a Friday night in Berry. Used to be. Trust me, you had to fight your way to the front of the queue to spend your money. The fans were nuts for it, and they were loving every second of the shows. Between 2009 and 2014, TNA legit had a big opportunity in the UK. WWE was still doing their yearly tour as well, but it felt like TNA cared more. I had random people asking me about TNA wrestling. I had never thought I would have wrestling discussions with Bold Barry at the Mem. TNA would make a lot of money on these UK tours and the wrestlers were happy to be appreciated more. So why not do more? Why was there never a UK pay-per-view? Why not embrace the UK more? Just to be clear, I'm not suggesting by any means they should have moved their base of operations to the UK. Logistically, that would not have been possible. But why not come here a bit more? Why not have a killer pay-per-view in front of 20,000 fans? They could have done it, you know. 
and I can't help but feel the whole thing was a case of them flushing money down the toilet and not striking while the iron was hot. And no, one night only shows do not count as pay-per-views. Nobody cares about them. Tito Ortiz. This one was a waste of time and money. You could probably put all the MMA guys in here, but let's focus on Tito. It wasn't the first time Tito Ortiz had been in TNA, but the first time he showed up in the early days, it was pretty unoffensive. The second time was a different kettle of fish. Towards the end of the Aces and Eights Invasion storyline, TNA kept teasing that someone was debuting in the company and they were using this August 1st warning promo. They hyped the hell out of the mystery reveal. It had people throwing around big names like Goldberg and Batista. His debut finally came around. They were on the road in Texas. Cheap porno music hit and out walked a strange looking old man with his arms folded. The crowd were in silence. I had no idea who this man was. The camera panned around the ring to show the reactions of the wrestlers, with Mr. Anderson doing his best to turn it into more of a joke than it already was. And then he just proceeded to stand there, arms folded. He didn't say anything or do anything. If anyone in Texas drops by that arena, rumour has it that Tito Ortiz can still be seen to this day standing around with his arms folded, waiting for a reaction from the crowd. TNA were being forced to show the Bellator guys on their show. They also spent a lot of time on Rampage Jackson at the time, but for me it wasn't as bad as Tito Ortiz. Rampage and Tito were set to fight in Bellator MMA, and TNA hyped up their match every week. It was annoying because you were constantly having to hear about another sport when you tuned in to watch wrestling, but it was made worse by how devoid of talent the guy was. He did absolutely nothing, looked completely out of it, and had one of the worst debuts in TNA history. And oh, did I forget to mention that after all of this, the Tito Ortiz and Rampage Jackson fight never happened. So it was a complete waste of time. I have no idea what Tito was paid during his time in TNA, but as time on TV is precious, he sure wasted a lot of it. Johnny Fairplay. I literally have no idea who this guy was. He doesn't look like an athlete, he just looks like a goofball. Out of all the C-list celebrities, this one has to be the worst. Yes, worse than JWoww. She didn't earn anything near as much as this guy got. I don't care how bad that match was. He was in some American TV program called Survivor. You know, I'm interested now, because this wasn't the first person TNA signed who appeared on that program. If anyone's listening right now who watched both Survivor and TNA, did you find this debut interesting? Did it make you want to watch TNA seeing these people from Survivor on the show? So, he was pretty much a nobody from a reality TV show. As far as this TNA work went, he was there during the Dusty Rhodes TNA era. He was always seen in the back of a pickup truck with hay bales talking to the knockouts. TNA paid him $150,000 a year. He made eight appearances. They then re-signed him for another year because clearly someone enjoyed pissing their money up a wall. He didn't make a single appearance in his second year, meaning he made $300,000 for roughly 40 minutes of TV time. Jesus Christ. Mick Foley. Thought I'd better chuck a wrestler into this list too. In a world where TNA hired people like Rob Terry, Garrett Bischoff and Black Rain, it's hard to imagine how Mick Foley could be classed as a waste of money. Look, these guys were bad, but they were not on anywhere near the kind of money that Foley was. And he was there for three years as well in a prominent role, so he would have made a lot more than them. No TNA fans particularly wanted to see him in the company. What followed was one of the worst TNA world champions of all time. Bad matches, countless general manager angles, and a terrible sense of humour that only goons on the internet in their mum's basements find funny. The reoccurring joke was that Foley liked to use Twitter, and he was obsessed with the word tweet. It wasn't funny. And that's coming from a guy who likes hawks. I don't want to come across as disrespectful, but even the man himself has described his time in the company as a complete flop. So it's hard to argue with me, isn't it? And the biggest waste of money is... Yes, you're right, congratulations, you win a hawk feather and a punch to the gut, congratulations little man. Look, Hogan and Bischoff were the biggest waste of money in TNA. You all knew this was going to be number one. Let's put aside all the hatred and bad booking, nepotism, jobs for the boys, abyssomania, all that garbage that happened and focus on the cold hard facts. Hogan was paid $35,000 per appearance. And that's just for him, his grey friend would have also been making a pretty penny too. And just think about it, they were paid all of that money, and all they did was drive away TNA fans. Ultimately, they did nothing to help the company grow. I've mentioned this before, but I didn't make it clear. Spike TV was fronting the cost for these guys. TNA were not shelling out the millions themselves for these guys. 
but what it comes down to is that they would have wanted them there. And I bet they pushed for them to be there. So this is still a way that TNA wasted money. Hogan being there enabled them to do some things like signing RVD. But did any of that really help them in the long run? The value of Hogan and Bischoff's contracts are not the reason that the company is in the hole that it's in today. But whatever you say, they were responsible for a lot of the stuff that I've previously mentioned on this list taking place. And that's why they have to sit at the number one spot. Plus, the Hawk will always be number one, so shove it if you don't like it.